We welcome back to Personally Speaking today, Bill O'Reilly, his latest best-selling book, Killing the Witches. Stay with us. Hello and welcome to Personally Speaking. I'm your host, Monsignor Jim Lasanti, and television journalist and best-selling author Bill O'Reilly joins me once again. For 20 years, Bill O'Reilly reported on current events on the O'Reilly Factor on the Fox News Channel, and his show became the most viewed cable news broadcast in America. His website, BillOReilly.com, is followed by millions around the world, and he hosts the O'Reilly Update, which is heard weekdays on more than 225 radio stations across the country. Bill has written 18 national number one best-selling nonfiction books, including the historical Killing series, which is the best-selling nonfiction series of all time with over 19 million books in print. Bill's latest book is called Killing the Witches. The subtitle is The Horror of Salem, Massachusetts, which revisits one of the most frightening and inexplicable episodes in American history. Killing the Witches talks about the dramatic history of how Puritan tradition and the powers of early American ministers shaped the origins of the United States and how rumors of demonic possession and witchcraft consumed Salem in 1692 and 1693. Bill O'Reilly is here with us today to tell us why he wrote Killing the Witches and what happened in Salem, Massachusetts, and how fear can sometimes overcome fact and reason. We welcome back Bill O'Reilly to our program. We're talking about his latest hit book called Killing the Witches, which I read and I couldn't put down. So I got to ask you, Bill, this guy, though, who shares the uh, the cover with you, Martin Dugard, how would you meet him and how do you guys work together? Well, Dugard lives in Orange County, California. Uh, it was a interesting meeting. Uh, he's a Roman Catholic and I'm a Roman Catholic. And I had a deal, a handshake deal, with another historian to do my research for a series of history books, which turned out to be the Killing series. Anyway, the guy reneged, and uh, I was looking around for another researcher, and Dugard uh, came to my attention through an agent. And at the time, he was not doing real well. Um, but he signed on with me, and now he's doing very well, because <laughs> we've written... <laughs> 13 uh, massive bestsellers, and uh, he's a good guy. He uh, it takes about a, a year to put a killing book together. Mm -hmm. That's six months of research, six months of writing. So he's a primary researcher, and he sends me the stuff, and I shape it into a story, just like you give your sh sermon on yeah. Sunday and Saturday evening. I, I do the same thing. I tell a story about the historical research that we have, and that formula has been very successful. Bill, you know, you're a bigger than life presence, as you know. How's the guy's ego? Can he deal with the fact that uh, we pick up the book because Bill O'Reilly's name's on it and he does yeah. a lot of the homework? He's OK with that? He's making a lot of money, Monsignor, <laughs> so I think he's... <laughs> Good reason to be okay happy with, with that. It, yeah. I, think he's, I think he's OK with that. All right, let's talk about Ann Putnam, one of the great characters in the book, who's responsible for a lot of the madness that takes place in Salem. Uh, you make the case very persuasively that... Uh, witch hunting and, and uh, cancel culture and going after people personally with lies is, is not something limited to Salem, but continues to this day. Ann Putnam was one of those people back then who's responsible for a lot of what took place. Who are the Ann Putnams of today? Well, let's give the audience a little background if they yeah. haven't read Killing the Witches. So okay. the reason I wrote the book was because the witch trials, the witch hunts in 1692 have returned. Uh, to America in 2023 in the form of the cancel culture. So what this is are accusations unproven. Obviously, these girls, Ann Putnam was a, a young girl. And, and they couldn't prove anybody was a witch. They just accused them. And two weeks later, these four people had ropes around their neck. So today, the cancel culture is designed to do the same thing, eliminate people. Uh, you can't hang them anymore, but we can destroy their lives, mm -hmm. uh, make it impossible for them to be employed uh, and destroy their families. That's exactly what happened in 1692. So the girls back then were 
uh, and the boys. There was no childhood under the theocracy of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So the Puritan ministers came over. They were actually booted out of England by the king. Uh, they come over in the Mayflower, harrowing. We put you on the Mayflower in the beginning of the book. You don't want to be there. Um, and then they come here, and there's no fun. Can't have any fun. Any fun sends you directly to hell. So the kids are like crazy. And then a slave woman named Tituba, who came from Barbados, arrives in Salem to work for a minister. And she minds the minister's kids uh, and then tells them stories of witchcraft and voodoo and all of these things that were handed down to her. And the kids' imaginations run wild and they're so bored and they're so crazy, these children, that they begin the accusations. And they're taken seriously and 20 human beings ex are executed, hundreds of others put into jail. Okay, that's what happens back then. But now let's move it to modern day America. Um, what, what defenses do we have against that same culture of accusation without any evidence that can destroy lives? And how do we, well, change, it? Be, how do we change that? It's a good question. It used to be truth is your best defense, right? right? There's no truth anymore mm. because the corporate media and the internet which drive accusations. See, in order to get an accusation into the public, you've got to do it through the internet, social media, or on television or in the newspaper. You gotta, you gotta get it there. Neither one of those two are interested in any truth. So the accusation, if they hear it, particularly if it's a famous person, but even if it isn't, yeah. all right, boom, page one. Young a high school teacher in Northern Virginia, okay? Watching TV one night, police come to her door and arrest her. She didn't know what's going on. I think she's about 25, 26. We write about it in Killing the Witches. All right, take down to the uh, police station, booked. Cops call the local media all over the place. A student had said that she acted appropriately toward him. Two weeks later, the charges are dropped. There's no evidence at all. The woman was fired from her job, not reinstated, okay? Whole life ruined, scorned. She sues and wins, but still, her whole life, boom, in the blink of an eye. So what's her defense? She denied it. Ultimately, the authorities dropped it. She did win in court, but her life is a wreck. So we have a number of those stories at the end of Killing Witches. Um, and I'm saying to myself, this is so bad, the denial of due process in this country. I don't know how you correct it, Monsignor. I just don't know how you correct it. Well, you know, let's make this more personal. There have been times when you've been accused. And Bill, um, you have the means because you keep bouncing back and being successful one thing after another. But did you ever say to yourself somewhere along the line, some of this stuff is so much BS, I'm gonna fight them tooth and nail? Well, I always do. Okay. So I've been in the last 27 years that I've done national news analysis, yeah. attacked every single day, oh, every day about whatever it may be. Most of them I, I ignore, but some of them I don't. But it costs for me to right the wrong, and I have millions of dollars. Yeah. Most people don't have millions of dollars. Right. Because I have to hire lawyers. They have to go in. They have to get into the, the system and there's depositions and it just never ends. Yeah. So this is so heinous and I'm not the only one. I mean, every single person that I know that does news analysis is attacked. Yeah. And it's just a, a, across the board. And, and there, these are very well financed attacks in many cases. There's money. People are being paid money mm -hmm. to say things about other people. And it's a form of power. So just like in Salem, the clerics, the ministers use this witchcraft thing to become more powerful. Yeah. You know, everybody's afraid of them. They did what they said. They don't want to be accused of being a witch. Okay. Now it's political. So they'll accuse, 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 try to wipe you off the map. So you put it correctly. I have the resources to fight it. I have, I've won. But the damage of the fight is still, you know, pretty substantial. Right. And not everyone can do that. Bill, in, in uh, Killing the Witches, you get into an interesting uh, commentary on uh, 
Benjamin Franklin, what came out of uh, Salem and the theocracy that took place there? How did it impact on this legend of the early time of our country, Ben Franklin? What did he do about this? Well, this is one of those things that nobody knew, including me. And I thought I was like Mr. History, right? I didn't know this. So when the Salem witch trials took place 25 miles north of Boston, but a lot of the witches were put in Boston jails because there wasn't enough room in Salem. And Benjamin Franklin was a teenager in Boston. He was a genius. And he started to follow. He, it wasn't contemporaneous. This happened before Franklin. Okay, but it was written about. And the chief witch hunter, a man named Cotton Mather, was alive, still a preacher in Boston. And Franklin went to his house. And they had a long conversation. We detail that conversation in Killing the Witches. Franklin was so unsettled by that, he never forgot it. And he brought it to Philadelphia when he had become the most powerful American in the world. And when the Constitution was forged, Franklin said, no, we're not having any religion in the Constitution. And Jefferson and Madison sided with Franklin. Patrick Henry, Roger Sherman, and a bunch of others wanted in the Constitution for America to be defined as a Christian nation. Brawl. And we write about it extensively. Big brawl in Philadelphia over that. Franklin, Madison, and Jefferson win. Henry's so mad, he bolts and goes back to Virginia, okay? But to this day, the government cannot impose or endorse a religion in the United States, and that's the way it should be. Bill O'Reilly is our guest, Killing the Witches, this book. Bill, when you talk about a false accusation, how do you fight back? I couldn't help but think, too, of our own uh, lovely Catholic Church, and I guess so many other groups, too. 96% of priests are clearly uh, innocent of any kind of wrongdoing toward kids. 4% did bad stuff. But you know and I know all it takes is an accusation to destroy a priest. For priests who don't have a whole lot of resources, what should we do? Well, at this point, I think the Australian case where the, in Australia, Cardinal and then Pell. it was subsequently uncovered that he was completely innocent. Mm -hmm. That was a tipping point. And then I think people started to say, OK, we need to be a little bit more skeptical here. Yeah. I feel very, very badly for anybody, not not only clerics, but anybody yeah. who has to go through this and, and, and is innocent and, and they're you know surrounded by the only thing you can do is just hold your head up, mm. tell the truth, and just keep pushing ahead. You know, it's one of those things like getting cancer, Monsignor. It's one of those things about being in a car accident that leaves you debilitated for the rest of your life. There's no explanation for it. Yeah. You know, the evil that men do. These young girls in Salem who were directly responsible for the deaths of human, 20 human beings, nothing happened to them. Most of their lives were wreckage. We do trace their lives after, but no legal authority went after them. They weren't held accountable for it. Neither were the witch hunters, Cotton Mather, Alton. They weren't held accountable, nor the clerics who drove it. Yeah. They but all got away with it, but they really didn't get away with it. And so you almost have to be philosophical about it. All you can do is all you can do. You know, Bill you just have to live your life. I've got to ask you, Bill O'Reilly, this Catholic Christian question, but whether it's uh, the, the people who suffered in Salem or clerics today or Bill O'Reilly or anybody who is uh, falsely or unjustly accused, what role should we embrace in terms of forgiving the person who accuses? Depends on what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're continuing to accuse, if they're unrepentant, then you got to go get them. Okay. You know, I mean, look, if you know Christian theology, it's up to God, all merciful God, right? Mm. It's up to me to stop evil. So okay. if evil is continuing, then I'm going after you. Okay? So you can say you're sorry all you want, but the next day you go out and do it again, I'm going after you. If somebody is sincere and, and comes, and this is very rare, <laughs> but Monsignor, he goes, really, I'm sorry. I, I, I did it, and I'm really sorry. I know I did wrong. I forgive him in heart because that's the theology. We have to do that. Yeah. 
We have to. But to continue to do evil and then go, oh, yeah, I'm sorry about that, but I'm going to continue to do it. No, yeah. not me. I'm St. Michael the Archangel on that one. <laughs> okay. Bill O'Reilly is our guest, Killing the Witches is his latest great book. And now, since you identified as Catholic early on, I'm I'm also one of them. I gotta ask you this question. There's synod going on in, in Rome bringing all these people together. If what comes out of it is uh women deacons and blessing of gay unions, how does Bill O'Reilly Catholic feel about that? You know, I got uh, Robert Barron, I think you know him, yeah, sure. uh, Bishop Barron over there, and then I'm, I'm talking to him about it. Uh, that's way beyond uh, my uh, station in life. Okay. See, I'm not judging anybody. I, I don't have that moral authority to do that. I think it would be a much better world if everybody understood that we as flawed human beings, sinners, don't have the moral authority to judge anybody. The Christian theology is that marriage is between a man and a woman. So we're going to keep that. I assume, I don't think Pope Francis is going to knock that out. If you want to be compassionate to people who are gay, who want to get married, I don't see anything wrong with that. Okay. But I don't think that within the theology, it's going to expand out of sacrament of marriage to anybody but man or woman. Okay. Just my opinion. And uh, just today I had a funeral where uh, a Lutheran deacon a uh, woman came to church and was asking when we might have uh, women deacons in the church. Any particular point of view as a Catholic? I like women deacons. I think they should do it tomorrow. Okay, good, good. Priests good. is a different story because of the fact that if you are a cleric, a priest in a Catholic church, that is your primary family. Mm -hmm. If you have another family... And then you get into dissolution of marriages and, and uh, kids who are not behaving or whatever. It's impossible. You can't, as a priest, tend to your flock and then re and have a family at the same time. There's too much going on there. But women deacons, bring them on. Why bring not? On. Okay. Bill, it's a moral and political question I'm going to ask you now. Were you shocked at all by the fact that, because I am, I admit it, that uh, in light of the slaughter that took place outside of Gaza, that we're facing so many demonstrations that are pro-Palestinian in this country with seemingly no regret for the, the Israeli victims? Well, these are stupid people. Uh, that's my commentary tonight on the No Spin News, <laughs> which you can access on BillOReilly.com. That's where yeah. we live. Did you know, my dear, thanks to your prayers, uh, BillOReilly.com is the most successful independent news agency in the world right now? I'm not surprised We're at worldwide. all. I'm not okay. surprised at all. So people who, who embrace Hamas at any level are stupid people. Mm -hmm. They don't understand what Hamas is. They don't care to understand what it is. Always remember, people believe what they want to believe. All right, I believe in God because I want to believe in God. God's never shown up here at my house, okay? But I want to believe in him, so I believe in him. For whatever reason, some people want to believe that Israel's a fascist state. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're going to believe. And you can give them history lessons, you can show them this, that, the other thing. They're not going to believe it. So... When I see the Harvard people, and that's my alma mater, as you may know, out there going right on Hamas, I know that these people doing that don't know anything. They don't know what Hamas is, who's behind Hamas, what the philosophy is. They don't know what the Germans did. They don't know what Stalin and Russia did. They don't know anything. They're told something, and that's what they want to believe, so they believe it. I kind of dismiss those people. Mm -hmm. I don't really take them seriously. They would never in a million years approach me or debate me, ever, yeah. because they'd be reduced to dust. <laughs> you know, Ash Wednesday is, from dust we come to dust you shall return. Well, they would, sh they would return to dust quicker than if they debated me. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, uh, I, I don't want to... 
I don't want to denigrate or make light of the fact that these people exist. Right. But they're not serious people. Some of them are neurotic haters and you got to watch them. Uh, Bill O'Reilly is big into details and facts, so I want to give our listeners and viewers a fact, too. He does have a degree from the beautiful people at Harvard, but he also went to Chaminade Catholic Boys High School and Marist College, so he's well Catholic educated. Any regrets on either of those experiences? No, Harvard was good for me, exposed me to a lot of uh, people that I never would have met. And uh, when I went there in the 90s to get a master's degree, it wasn't crazy. Marist College was excellent for me. Uh, Working class school, played football. It has now gone woke. It's interesting. The further away they get from the Marist brothers who built the school, literally built it, and then the school went secular in the late 1960s, the further they get away from that, the worse the school becomes. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I didn't send my son to that school because it's insane, in my opinion, Marist College. Chaminade was very disciplined. I didn't particularly enjoy it. I played ice hockey there and that was fun, but it it served me well. And my father was right. I want to go to the public school. He goes, you're going to Chaminade. You go to the public school, you're going to be in prison. He was right. (laughs) Okay. Thank you, dad, for the wisdom of the ages. You bet. On a, on a personal note, too, for our listeners and watchers, I had the privilege of meeting and talking at length to uh, Bill's mom and the great lady. And I, I mentioned that, Bill, because I always like to go to family awards. And the good stuff that you got from mom and dad, what, what did they give you? Dad, we know, gave you that great education. And from mom, what did you get that's of value to you even now? Um, so I'm doing a show on August 27th at the Paramount Theater in Huntington called a New York State of Mind, and I'm getting into all of that, about how my upbringing, which is really your upbringing and everybody's upbringing in the New York area, right? Uh, you know, working class upbringing, mm-hmm. how it was and why it has changed. That's the theme of the show. We do it funny. Um, so my mother and father were children of the Depression. Mm-hmm. That was the key. And then my father went off to World War II as a naval officer, as I write about in Killing the Rising Sun. They had a point of view that this country was noble. They had a responsibility to raise their children in the church and as decent human beings. Okay, they weren't smoking pot on the weekends and there were rules. I got to ask you, in light of our country, Bill, which is divided and the world, which is divided, is Bill O'Reilly a man of hope? Yes, because history goes in cycles. Okay. so we're in a down cycle now on every front. And a lot of it's because of this. So people now have abdicated personal responsibility and they create their lives on on an artificial machine. And that takes out a lot of humanity, a lot of compassion, a lot of empathy, goes right at the window. But we need strong leadership here to emerge. We don't have it now. And I think it will. It has, it always has, you you know? So I am, you know, I'm not a cynical guy. I'm I'm a guy who problem solves and leaves it out there the way I see it. And hopefully people will uh, understand what I'm talking about and try to do the right thing. Bill, you read the polls and I read the polls. The polls that say that uh, the majority of the country doesn't want this to be in 2024, a repeat of, of 20 in terms of Biden versus Trump. Uh, is that the way it's going to go, first of all? And are you one of these people who says, I wish there was another candidate? Well, look, I want uh, the best for the country. I'm not really qualified to say who the best candidate is. I'll give you strengths and weaknesses all day long. Right. I don't think right. Biden's going to run again. Okay. Um, Trump looks like he's going to get the nomination. But with Trump, any day could be anything. (laughs) So it's not a lock. But at this point, if the election were held tomorrow, it would be Trump versus Biden. But I I think Biden leaves the stage, Mm -hmm. a lot of stuff building against him. And Trump is Trump. All right. He ran the country pretty well in four years. But as far as his presentation is concerned, I'd like to have him locked in a room with St. Francis for about 48 (laughs) hours. 
that would be a, a miraculous and wonderful thing. But let's say That's that tomorrow right. uh, Joe Biden says, uh, I'm tired and I'm going to give it up. But I'm first going to pardon my son and uh, I'm resigning early. So Kamala becomes president. So she's the incumbent running against Donald Trump. Uh, who wins that election? You know, I think they challenge Kamala. They would uh, primary her. OK, I don't think Kamala is going to walk in, even if she's the vice president, should be a placeholder, okay. never get anything done at all with the Republican House. Yeah. Um, and she's deeply unpopular in this country. And, and in my opinion, not up for the job. She's not up for the job of vice president. And nobody knows what that job is. And she can't even do it. So and, and Gavin looks the part. But do you see him as president? Gavin Newsom, California? No, nah, it's too radical out there. People really knew what was going on in California. Um, they'd be horrified. Bill O'Reilly's really here. We're talking about killing the witches, among other things. Bill, I promise, last question, then I'll get back to you. Okay. Very busy and full life. So at every level, you've had incredible success. You know, the books go through the roof. You sell millions of copies. You've been number one guy on TV. Uh, you're popular. You're well paid. You have more money than you can spend in your lifetime. Everything has, in the end, gone well for Bill O'Reilly. So i got to ask you, when you're at this point in life where it's all come together nicely... <sighs> What in the world does Bill Riley do next? Um, you know, I'm trying to stay on the planet so that my son, who uh, is at Oxford now, oh, he cool. goes to Salve Regina College. He's a third year abroad student. Um, he can be a force and he wants to get into politics. OK, so I'm trying to stay around, uh, give him a little protection. Uh, and a little guidance. That's really my main focus now. My daughter is in law school. I'm trying to get her on a pathway to help children. She is a strong interest in doing that. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's it. And then if I can get those two things accomplished, then uh, St. Peter and I can have our conversation. I want to thank Bill O'Reilly for being with us. I hope people will get Killing the Witches. Bill, as everybody knows, started life as a, as a great journalist, and now he's a great historical writer. But he combines his journalistic ability with his knowledge of the history to make everything he writes so wonderfully readable that anybody will benefit by reading his books. And that's a great gift that God and his parents gave to him, along with Shamanad Maris and the Kennedy Center at, J at Harvard. Bill, thank you for all you do. Thank you for your honesty and directness. And uh, keep on writing because we need to hear your voice. Appreciate it. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Monsignor. Thanks so much, Bill. Bye-bye. Thanks for being with us today. If you need to reach me for any reason, you can get me at personally speaking podcast at gmail.com. You can probably listen to this program on Sirius XM, the Catholic channel, but you can also watch us on YouTube. I'm privileged to serve as host and executive producer, personally speaking. Our producer is Lisa Jandovitz. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be with you again next time on Personally Speaking.